Well, hey there, fellas. Mr. Halter here, back in the saloon, whipping through the book of Acts with you. A great word from Ryan last week, and uh, we're in chapter four this week. There's a lot to it, so let's plow in. Um, if you remember, we've had a healing going on. Um, Peter and John were part of uh, healing a man, and so the word's spreading all over the place. There's, now there's starting to be people that just don't get it, and they're starting to come against the boys. So chapter 4, verse 1, the teaching and the preaching of Peter and John angered the priests and the, cap, the captain of the temple police and the representatives of the Jewish sect called the Sadducees. In another chapter, it will add another group, the Jewish leaders, the religious scholars, and the elders. So if you can imagine, the people that are having the hardest time with Jesus are um, primarily those who's uh, might be more concerned about their power, their prestige, literally their money and their resource, because oftentimes those that were in the know or in the, uh, I guess the right groups also got the money. And specifically mentions the Sadducees and it says they're furious that the people were being taught that in Jesus there is a resurrection from the dead. So the Sadducees specifically were more like a religious group, kind of like a right-wing group or a left-wing group. And they denied the supernatural specifically. And so if you deny the supernatural, what you're left with is the natural. And I'll try to keep that in mind as we go through this because um, I think for many people, even inside the church, it's been a long time since we believe that we've seen the supernatural. And oftentimes our faith um, actually takes on a much more just kind of natural. Like we go through life normally. We don't expect that God's going to show up. Um, and do anything that would be outside of the natural. So these were the Sadducees. A lot of people believed what these guys believed, that there might be a God kind of uh, source or force up there in the clouds, but it's not going to have uh, anything to do with sickness or suffering or actual practically helping people. And so this is what really set off the book of Acts, is that all, all sorts of people were actually... Um, experiencing the power of God and that's what began to travel as far as a word or a testimony and so this goes on they, they have him arrested they hold him overnight blah 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 and then it actually says that um, while this was going on so while there's all this questioning about 5,000 men believed in the story and they probably only mentioned the men but um, this would have been family so we think probably just within this little story of this one man being healed probably about 15,000 people are actually going, I buy it, like I'm in. And so there's quite a bit of kerfuffle in the Jewish Roman landscape. And so uh, a lot of people are feeling threatened. And so the next day, many Jewish leaders, religious scholars, elders of the people convened a meeting in Jerusalem. And Annas, the high priest was there, and Caiaphas, John Alexander, and others who were members. Uh, of the high priestly family, okay? So a lot of people who don't want anything to ruffle feathers or cause taxes to be challenged. They don't want any of their uh, power uh, to be toppled, if you will. So they made Peter and John stand in front of the council as they questioned them saying, tell us by what power and authority you've done these things. And Peter filled with the Holy Spirit answered, respected elders and leaders of the people listen. So he starts off nice anyway. Are we being put on a little bit of a like, a, almost like a little levity being brought in by Peter? Uh, are we being put on trial today for doing an act of kindness by healing a frail, crippled man? Um, well then, you and everyone else in Israel should know that it is by the power of the name of Jesus that this crippled man stands here today, completely healed. You crucified uh, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, but God raised him from the dead. There they go, proclaiming the resurrection again. This, as the resurrection was the primary message of the gospel, that God's not dead, he's alive. And so anything can happen at any point. This Jesus is the stone that you, the builders, have rejected, and now he has become the cornerstone. Uh, there is no one else who has the power to save us, for there is only one name to whom God has given authority by which we must experience salvation. And that is the name of Jesus. So they just say it flat out. You want to know, like, are you hassling us because this poor old guy got healed? Of course not. That's not your problem. The problem is that we're proclaiming 
that Christ has risen from the dead. And so that means that, that there's much more going on than you guys can even control and understand. And then, you know, what he says here is actually not making this up. He's um, reading back or he's has probably memorized as a Jewish boy uh, the Psalms. And Psalm 118, I'm going to take you to it. It's fantastic. Let's see here. Psalm 118. And this is David after he's shipwrecked his entire life and now God's begun to restore him again. And so uh, he, he says, you came to my rescue and broke open the way into a beautiful and broad place. Now I know the Lord, you are for me and I will never fear what man can do to me. So you're, you'll start to pick up on these apostles, these general normal dudes that are empowered by the Holy Spirit, that they start to not be concerned about what anybody thinks of them anymore or what um, might happen to them. They're actually starting to just go, uh, we're only going to fear Jesus. He's going to, we're actually going to play to an audience of one. Now we're not going to worry about what the in-laws say, what our pastor says, uh, what religious aunts and uncles around our family say. We're not going to, we're just not going to worry about uh, anybody on the school council or uh, some political leader or our neighbor, we're just literally um, going to fear the Lord. So now I know, Lord, that you are for me and I will never fear what man can do to me. You, for you stand beside me as my hero who rescues me. I've seen with my own eyes the defeat of my enemies. I've triumphed over all of them. Lord, it is so much better to trust in you to save me than to put my confidence in anything else. Yes, it is so much better to trust in the Lord to save me than to put my confidence in celebrities. Once I was hemmed in, surrounded by those who don't love you, but by Yahweh's, catch this, by Yahweh's supernatural power, I overcame them all. So what Peter and John and those that began to testify about Jesus were actually saying is that Jesus is now the center stone by which the entire new building of the church is going to be built. He's the cornerstone. If you are into any building, you know that generally you have to square off of a corner. Uh, I've told you the story probably of the greenhouse that I tried to square out uh, in our field. My daughter's doing a, a cut flower business, and so she goes, Dad, I need a greenhouse. So it was right out in the middle of a field, a 20-acre field. So nothing really to square it to. I did run a fence, and I thought my fence looked pretty straight, so I tried to square off of that. And it might be the worst thing I've ever built, like nothing fit. And uh, if, if you've ever tried to square a building and then you go to put the framing up and then you try to put the roof uh, rafters in and then you try to put the plastic on the roofs, you realize if the cornerstone, if, if, if what's going to hold the entire house together and square it is not square, nothing from that point on is going to work out. And that was the case. I was like jigsawing at strange angles to try to make uh, some piece of roofing fit. So the point of the gospel is that Jesus is the cornerstone. Later on in, in the epistles, they'll talk about we are being built into the same house that Jesus was the cornerstone of, okay? So we become the building blocks, but Jesus is the one that anchors it uh, to terra firma. He's the one that squares everything. So if you take the cornerstone away, obviously the entire house falls down. And so you can see the metaphor there. Um, but don't just go, hey, I, yeah, Jesus is going to be the cornerstone of my life. It's not just a general Jesusness that's the cornerstone. It's literally the supernatural resurrected Jesus that's the cornerstone. And that makes all the difference. So uh, when we are coming into situations in our lives where we're being pressured, because we, we feel pressure all the time to not really be faithful to Jesus, whenever those pressures happen, um, we have to remember, look, what, what's at the center of our life that holds it all together is not just a belief system about Jesus. And it's not just an occasional weekend church service to sort of like pay homage to Jesus. Um, I actually am believing that Jesus is alive and well and that he will work in my life supernaturally in circumstances in my money, in my relationships. Like there's no relationship that's been blown apart too much for God to fix. There's there's no financial scenario that you can make up where God could not somehow make a way through. 
Um, so you just, you picture anything that men feel stress about. And this is what Jesus is saying. Like, guys, no matter what, please don't trust in celebrities. Don't trust in anything. Don't, for sure, don't put your trust. Um, or try to angle or manipulate your way into certain things, certain circles, getting on the rotary, whatever, so that there'll be some general benefit to you. Just put me at the corner of your building and know that I can work miracles all the time. And so I'm going to give you a couple questions um, just that I want you guys to process through. I think they're hard questions, okay? Um, because at the end of the day, what we see is these men, um, they're kind of called publicly to like make some account. And this was actually kind of a funny part at the end. It says, um, so they brought them back before the council and they command them never to teach the people or speak again using the, the name of Jesus. They had just said that, hey, they were actually all talking, going, look, we can clearly see that this miracle happened. Like nobody denied the miracle, even these guys. They're like, okay, this happened. Uh, is causing a lot of trouble, but the people are so fired up and excited about this. Like we just can't like mess this up. All we can do is try to get these guys to just sh shut it, like not to keep talking about it. So they bring them up to get But Peter and John replied, you can judge for yourselves. Is it better to listen to you or to God? Is it impossible? Or they say it's impossible for us to stop speaking about all the things we've seen and heard. So these guys are just going, look, Guys, we've got the Roman centurion guard going on here. We've got uh, these powerful political uh, Sadducees. We've got the elders of the community, which means uh, the ones, the, the top end of the mafia. We've got all these guys, the religious scholars, guys that claim to know more Bible than anybody. And so they're saying, look, I guess maybe all of you feel pressure to keep sort of kowtowing to each other's uh, power and control, but you be the judge. Would, in light of the fact that there was a supernatural healing and therefore evidence that there is actually an alive God, do you think it makes more sense to worry about you guys or to worry about the God that did all these amazing things? So they just cut right through the BS, which is a great thought for all of us. Uh, when you're hemmed in by pressure, just try to think through that. If I make this decision, or if I hedge that maybe God's not alive or real, and so I'm going to try to get as much as I can out of this life, does that make sense? Or is there has there been enough evidence in your life or watching what Jesus has done in the lives of other men to at least go, it can't be coincidence. And if it's not coincidence, then maybe it's worth banking everything on, even when we can't see it around the corner. So here's some questions for us. Number one, what is everybody else? Now, these are the ways most men would think about, okay, what is everybody else doing around me? Um, that's what most of us would do. We just go, well, they're all making tons of money, buying big houses, keeping most of the money for themselves. Blah, blah, blah. So that's, you could ask that question. What is everybody else doing? Always remember though, when Jesus talked about his way, he said there's a wide way and a narrow way. So uh, you can almost be sure in most scenarios that if it's what people are not doing, that's probably closer to what, <laughs> what the Lord's doing. So that's first question. What is everybody else doing? Second question is what are we told that we should do? What are we being told that we should do or to believe? Oftentimes that happens in, in a religious upbringing. You're told what to do. And then you find out later that that didn't square with uh, the story or the teachings of Jesus. So you might uh, fall to the customs, if you will. Um, the third question might be, what's most expedient for me to do? And that's a question of kind of personal gain. It's, it's how all corruption begins. When you think about it, all the millions of people that have just said, yeah, whatever the mafia is doing, I guess I got to play along when we think about corrupt police or corrupt religious leaders or whatever it might be. That's what they're trying to figure out. What's most expedient? How can I get the most benefit? Fourth question might be what, um, well, what would I like to do? At the end of the day, a lot of times the idea of following Jesus, 
you go, well, if I do that, that's not going to bode well. Even caring for people, if you like try to help a neighbor with a jacked up marriage, you go, nah, I just don't think I'm going to get involved. Because you know that if you do, it's probably going to work. <laughs> Supernatural power will happen. And then you'll have to actually walk with a friend or a couple. Um, if, you, if you jump into issues of poverty, uh, abuse, neglect, foster care, uh, all the ills of, of society that you know Jesus wants us to jump into. Oftentimes we go, yeah, but at the end of the day, I don't really want to carry the weight of this thing. Uh, I don't want to mess up my life it's like working pretty good right now and so that might be something you go like I just would like to do not what Jesus is doing but at the end of the day what you see Peter and John do is this question uh, they're going here's what we're gonna do so not what everyone else is doing what we're told we should do what's expedient to do or what we would like to do Following Jesus is really about declaring, this is what we're going to do. And so we're going to proclaim Jesus. We're just going to tell people what we've seen. Um, and we're going to let the chips fall where they may. So we're going to be men of character that legitimately align our lives. And we risk everything on the story of a supernatural God that's still alive. So uh, might be some challenge there for us today, guys. Um, a lot of hard stuff. A lot of amazing stuff, though, to think about, no matter how you know, what we might have to give up for the gospel. Um, you know, let's just say it's not true. Let's say the story is not real. Um, in most cases, we probably will not have, have to give it up much. Um, and if it's real, that'll be the best thing in the world to know that we risk for him. Um, I've, I have a pastor buddy that says, man, he just doubts God all the time. And I'm like, well, why do you stay in it? He's like, well, even if it's not true, it's like still the best way to live. And uh, for me, that's not enough. Like, it's really not enough. <laughs> if it's really not true, I'd love to get out of it because it costs too much. It really does. It costs a lot. So for me, I'd rather be like Peter and John that take some time to reflect on where have I seen the supernatural of God in my life? And yeah, there's been enough of those that I can piece together a pretty good box of evidence that uh, it's now safe to bank the rest of my life on. So hopefully... That's how you're feeling. Um, but be honest with each other this week about uh, whether or not you've seen the supernatural in your own life or what you're asking God to show you. So we'll talk about that. Have a great week, fellas. May God be with you. May his favor and blessing and peace rest upon you. In Jesus' name, amen.